This is Ronald Coleman inviting you to radio's most dramatic half hour, Favorite Story. During the next half hour, we have only one intention, to frighten you out of your wits. For this week's favorite story is probably the most startling tale of horror ever dreamed on this planet. And strangely enough, it was written by a woman, the wife of one of the greatest poets of our language. Yes, before the minute hand of your watch completes its next half circle, you're coming face to face with Frankenstein's monster. If you enjoy feeling your blood pressure rise, your pulse quicken, you'll certainly enjoy Mary Shelley's ghastly adventure of Dr. Frankenstein. And would you like to know who picked Frankenstein as his favorite story? Uh, no, no, it wasn't Boris Karloff or Bella Lugosi. No, it's a man who has given you thousands of laughs over your radio, Mr. Fred Allen. We were a little surprised when Fred told us that Frankenstein was his favorite story. But he explained that he loves to be horrified when he listens to the radio. And that's why he, uh, <laughs> that's why he never misses the Jack Benny programs. Well, are all of you ready to have your spines chilled? Then here's the first act of Frankenstein. Come in, come in. My old friend, I didn't think you'd come. Have you nothing to say to me? A greeting for an old friend? I should not have come here. Oh, no, no, don't go. Don't leave me. Am I so disgusting to you, Clerval? You have changed, Victor. Victor. What a mockery my own name is. Victor Frankenstein. I should change it, my friend, <laughs> to vanquished, vanquished Frankenstein. Good name for me, eh, Clerval? Eh? Oh, it was not like this when we were at the university together, remember? At Ingolstadt. I remember. We were roommates, good friends. We used to play backgammon together. I used to win. I wonder if I could still beat you at backgammon, Clerval. I have a board here and at the dice. Insanity, Victor. This is what you called me here for. Urgent business. The matter of life or death. A game of backgammon. Don't leave me, Clerval. I'm afraid to be alone. One game for old time's sake. The old times have run out, Frankenstein. One game, I beseech you. Give me the dice. Well, like old times. When we were young, Clavel. When we could laugh. <laughs> Why must I have the luckiest man in the university as a roommate? It's not luck, my friend, it's faith. A conviction, Clerval, that no matter what the odds are against you, you can overcome them. You don't believe in the law of chance and averages? I believe in the law of myself and the power of the human brain. Well, you're high. Take the dice. Look at them, Clerval. The dice. Mm. What do you suppose they're made from? Oh, I don't know. Bone, perhaps? Once these were part of a living being. Strange, isn't it? What happens when a creature dies? 
Well, that's what we're here studying medicine for, Victor. To postpone death as long as possible. I wonder if there's another way, Cleval. I've been reading some of the ancient medical authorities like Albertus Magnus. Ah, uh, witch doctor. Oh, no, no. They didn't have our knowledge and our instruments, but they were intelligent men. Combine their ideas with what we know today, and the result may be a new way to defeat death. Come, come, Victor. Are, we, are you going to play or not? Of course I'm going to play. What a fine way to study medicine. What? Uh, Elizabeth! <laughs> what cloud did you drop from? Aunt Carolyn had to drive up to Ingolstadt for a few days, and she asked me to come with her. Elizabeth, darling, it's heavenly to see you again. <laughs> in the door, back gammon flies out the window. <laughs> See you both later. Of course, Saval. Oh, my darling. Uh, how's everyone in Geneva? Uh, how's William? Your little brother is an absolute charmer. The most beautiful child in the whole city. I hope I can be home for his 10th birthday. Well, why not? You'll be graduated by then, dear. Just think, my victor will be Dr. Frankenstein. Elizabeth. I won't be coming home after my graduation. Won't we'll have to postpone our wedding a few months longer, Elizabeth. There's something I must do first. There's something I must do first. Clavel, do you know what I did that summer after my graduation? I don't want to know. You're my only friend. You must listen. I went up into the mountains alone. I had stumbled onto a combining of ancient and modern theories which I breathed and was certain could create a living creature. It had become an obsession with me. I had to build with my own hands a human form and imbue life in it. months I devoted myself day and night to the most arduous, most revolting work that a scientist has ever undertaken. I became an habitué of graveyards, seeking beneath the freshly turned earth the materials with which I had to work. As I began to put together a creature of human form. I found the minuteness of the parts a great handicap. So I resolved, for the ease of working, to make the creature a giant, more than eight feet in height so that the component parts, arteries, veins, muscle tendons, would be easier to work with. During those months, Cleval, my hands performed deeds which the hands of men should never perform. The work was almost done. The huge, unclothed monster lay grotesquely on my work table. I had filled its gigantic frame with blood and planned on the following day to subject it to the electric shocks, which would activate its nervous system, make it a living, breathing creature. I sank to my couch, exhausted. Fell into a deep sleep. During the night, I heard the wind rise. It was disturbed fitfully by crashes of thunder and lightning flashes along the mountainside. Once, after a very near stroke of lightning seemed to electrify the air in my sleeping chamber, I thought I heard a sound from my laboratory. Then, did I dream this or did it really happen? The, the curtains around my bed were parted and I saw the monster. Its yellow skin, its unblinking eyes, the dry, papery lips moved. When I awoke in daylight, I laughed at what I thought had been a frightful dream. But at the door of my laboratory, I smelled the pungent ozone fumes which accompany a strong electric shock. To my horror, I realized that a near bolt of lightning during the night could have infused life into the monster, even as I had planned it in my controlled experiment. I flung open the laboratory door. My nightmare had happened. The monster was gone. For 
months, for a while, I searched for the creature. There are a few vague rumors, unconfirmed reports of a hideous shadow roaming the upper mountain valleys. Nothing to go on. I gave up the search, returned to Geneva. My poor Victor, we've been so worried about you. I'm all right, darling, now that I'm with you. You're so thin, Victor. Where have you been all these wretched months? Traveling, Elizabeth, in mind and body. Nothing you would understand or, or want to know. And that's all over now. No more travels or worries. You're home. Yes, home. Oh, darling, how soon can we be married? I'm casting away all my old life, all these unpleasantness. I'll set up practice here in Geneva. Uh, uh, come in. Dr. Frankenstein. I'm he. What do you wish, sir? I'm the prefect of police. I have some distressing news. Uh, what is it, sir? Your brother, William, has been killed. <gasps> no! How did it happen? An accident? No. No accident. He was strangled to death. But he's only a child, ten years old. So tell me exactly what happened. It was just growing dark, Doctor. The children were playing hide-and-seek together. Little William hid himself in a grove of bushes by the edge of the lake. There was a scream. But when they reached the child, the life had been choked out of him. Oh, how horrible. Officer, may I borrow a gun from you uh, oh. for only an hour uh, and for my own protection? Well, I can probably arrange it. Victor, what are you going to do? Where are you going? Find my brother's murderer. <laughs> Who's that? Frankenstein. What's there? Do you not remember? Get away. Don't touch me. I will not harm you, Dr. Frankenstein. You murdered my brother. Yeah. It makes me feel good to kill. I <laughs> wish to God I'd never created you. But you did create me. What I created, I can also destroy. Stand back, monster. You breathed your last breath. <laughs> die! Die! Why don't you die? <laughs> your little pistol cannot... Hurt me! Ah. Dear Lord in heaven, hear me, I beseech you. How can I destroy this thing before it destroys me? You know, Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, was the wife of Percy Bysshe Shelley, the British poet. I sometimes wonder what kind of married life they had together. Can you imagine Percy sitting at his work table of an evening writing, Hail to thee, blithe spirit, while Mary sat quietly at her desk, making monsters with her quill pen, and Percy looking up and saying, Darling, what rhymes with Ozymandias? And his wife replying, Don't interrupt me, dear, I'm right in the middle of a graveyard. Well, now, it's time we return to the black foothills of the Jura Mountains, where Dr. Victor Frankenstein is continuing his terrifying story to his friend Clerval. Here's Fred Allen's favorite story, Act Two. I go 
hold a seven, Clever. I see it. A lucky number. Did this monster, as you call it, have anything to do with what happened to Elizabeth? I'll tell you, Clever. I must tell someone. This frightful giant I had built came to me in the darkness, always in the darkness, and begged me to build another creature like himself. But a woman. Good Lord. The thing was lonely. Nowhere from no one could it receive friendship or affection. It demanded that I build another monster or a mate. I refused, and it threatened me. It swore a frightful oath. If you will not build me a companion, I will destroy everything you love, and I will be with you on your wedding day. What could I do? Elizabeth and I were engaged. Only a few weeks remained before we would have been married. I thought for the sake of her safety that I, I must do what the monster asked. So I climbed up to my dismal mountain laboratory where I had conducted the first experiment. I went into the workroom and I set about the disgusting labor of creating another giant, a woman. The task was half done, while the ghoulish torso lay incomplete on my work table. I paused to wonder, would the fiend keep its promise? Would the monster cease from murder and destruction, or would I be turning two demons loose upon the world? Two creatures which could breed children as hideous as themselves. In a few generations, these monsters born of my hand could extinguish civilization on this planet, perhaps wipe out the human race. I couldn't do this thing. I gathered together the poor pieces of my half-made creature, and I flung them from the ledge of a high cliff into a nearby lake. But as I did these things, I, I knew I was being watched. Somewhere in that forest of pine tree shadows, Somewhere among the moonless crags, I knew the two eyes were following my every movement. And as I packed my few belongings for the trip back home to Geneva, back to my precious Elizabeth, back to the little wedding chapel where we would be made husband and wife, one terrible memory kept echoing through my mind. I will be with you on your wedding day. And... Mr. Darling, what's troubling you? Nothing, my sweet. Nothing, really. Oh, this has been the happiest day of my life, Victor. And by far the most important. We are married. Do you realize that, dearest? Actually married. I hope that all our days together will be as happy as this one has been. Why shouldn't they be? What earthly thing could mar our happiness? Oh, Elizabeth, if you knew. If you only knew. Victor, what's the matter? Light a lamp, dear, quickly. It's almost dark here. We must have light. Afraid of the night, my sweet? Desperately afraid of this night. Elizabeth, until the sun rises again, you must not leave my sight. There's great danger, darling. Oh, Victor, you're overwrought. I must not leave you alone, not for a single instant. Is the new bride to have no privacy, then? Oh, come, Victor, kiss me farewell. No. For five minutes only. We've not even unpacked our bags. I must have time to arrange my wardrobe. Elizabeth, don't go, darling, don't. For five minutes only. Elizabeth. <laughs> Elizabeth!
poor darling Elizabeth. What have I done to you? You must not blame yourself, Dr. Frankenstein. You had nothing to do with this ghastly murder. I did. What? what? I'm to blame. I created my wife's murderer. Doctor. You're a magistrate, police officer. Arrest me. Take me to prison where I belong. Doctor, I can understand your emotional distress, but we know this dreadful night's happenings are no fault of yours. How do you know? Hear me, sir. Hear my confession. I have created a monster, built it with my own hands, imbued it with life. But this demon I created has no soul. It devotes itself to one fiendish purpose, to destroy all things that I love and which love me. Sir, send your police without in full force to scour the mountainside for this monster. It must be found. It must be found! Oh, poor fellow, he's out of his head with grief. You think I'm raving? I was never more sane in my life, sir. I tell you, I tell you, I've created an indestructible monster. Doctor, you must rest. Rest and sleep will make you feel better. You... you poor fools. You think I am mad. You, you are the mad one. Last throw of the dice, Kalaval. I will lose. Even as I had faith in my young days that I would win, now I have faith that I've already lost. Roll the dice, Victor. Get this over with. It's a long walk back to the city. I want to get home while there's still moonlight. Wait. Wait. Is it possible? Oh, no, 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 it's not possible. I thought for a moment, Clarala, that the dice moved in my hand. Moved? Of their own accord? They are made from bone, these dice. They were once living tissue and a living creature. I've made dead things live again. Victor, this is insane. You should submit yourself to qualified medical care. This monster you speak of, it's, it's nothing but a wild dream in your sick imagination. These unfortunate deaths close to you have warped your brain. Your monster does oh, not exist at all. Now, get a grip on yourself, man. You mm. never created such a creature. There is no such monster on the face of the earth. Creval, look behind you. Great God! You are a friend of... Frankenstein. No, no. Laval is no friend of mine. He's... Yo. Lie. I don't know him. Uh, He's not a friend. Uh, I kill all who are friends of Frankenstein. Get away from me. I... No, get away. Stay back. Stay back. Crimes. No, and will you destroy everything in my life? Everything but your life. It's go life. away. I go now, but I will be with you, Frankenstein. You are in my power forever. <laughs> Hear me, all living creatures within sound of my voice. Remember what I say. I warn you, the monster I created is still at liberty, roaming the dark places of the night. Beware of him, for with one silent stroke of his finger, he can crush out your life. Above all things, do not speak my name. 
the sound of the syllables Frankenstein makes the anger rise in the monster's brain. If you would say by name, he may think you a friend of Frankenstein. And his hairy hands will close about your throat as they did of that with little William and Elizabeth and poor Claval. I beg you, beware of the monster lurking in the shadows. And if God wills it, speak one prayer for the most wretched, lonely man who has ever walked this planet. Victor Frankenstein. <laughs> And thus we close the curtain on Fred Allen's favorite story. Sorry we couldn't arrange a happy ending, but that's the note on which Mary Shelley leaves us in her adventure of Frankenstein. We hope you've enjoyed this tale of fear. And we hope you'll plan to be with us next week when we bring you a favorite story as different from Frankenstein as day from night. Next week, we'll be the guests of Jules Verne. And we'll descend to the floor of the deepest ocean under the guidance of the inscrutable Captain Nemo. Yes, next week you can pack your bags for a journey of 20,000 leagues under the sea. This astonishing adventure is the favorite story choice of the famous actor, director, producer, and man about the entertainment world, Mr. Orson Welles. We hope you'll be listening.